Hello to all of you. Uh, welcome to this Biotech Week session. As you certainly know, the Biotech Week event is being held this week to promote all aspects of biotechnology. Across Europe, more than 100 events have been organized this week in 17 countries through our national association network. If you are interested uh, for more details on the Biotech Week, please do not hesitate to visit our Europa Bio website to get an overview of all the events that have been scheduled. I'm sure you will find several sessions that will highlight the contribution of innovative biotechnology benefiting European citizens and the planet. My name is Bernard Grimm. Uh, you don't see me at the moment, but uh, I hope you can all hear me properly. Uh, I'm the Healthcare Biotechnology Director at Europa Bio, and I will be moderating this event that we have planned with our partners from Invest Europe. Today's event is dedicated to investing in healthcare and more particularly on how can the revision of the general pharmaceutical legislation better attract investors in the future. Uh, in your role today for the audience, uh, please note that the webinar will be recorded and all the slides that will be presented will be made available. You can obviously ask your questions through the Q&A button uh, to the panelists, and I will make sure that I will funnel those questions to all the panelists. And obviously, you can also chat for comments to share all with uh, delegates. Uh, you can also join our slido.com uh, point at uh, EBW Healthcare, EBWHC. Uh, please don't hesitate to, to participate to our panel uh, discussion there, where the question is going to be, how can the revision of the general pharmaceutical legislation better attract investors in the future? And we're looking for your views. I believe this session today is perfectly timing, as no later than yesterday, Stella Kiriakidis, the Commissioner for Health and Food Safety, took what she called an important step for the reform of the EU pharmaceutical legislation, that is planned by the end of next year and announced the consultation that will run for 12 weeks until the 21st of September of December. At Europa Bio, we believe that the evaluation and the revision of the general pharmaceutical legislation is the perfect opportunity to create a future-proof, patient-oriented and leading science, life science and biotechnology sector in the EU. In our view, the first aim of this initiative should be to regain EU's global leadership as a home for R&D and the cutting edge industry to secure high quality care for citizens at affordable level. To discuss this important topic today, I'm extremely happy to be joined by an, an exciting and diverse panel representing our biotechnology ecosystem. And I will start first with Ingrid Mees who is our, the co-founder of Innovigate. She has 25 years of experience in life science expertise and in new product development and market introduction. We have also joining us today, Isabel Schuber, Global Head of IP Strategy at Novartis. So she will give us some view on the IP importance. We have Mr. Oscar Slotblum, General Partner at Biogeneration Venture Capital, who will join and give us the investor's view on, on the topic. And we have uh, also Stefan Geisel, who is the head of uh, Sobeo Health Policy Consulting. He's also the co-founder of Digestive Cancer Europe, and is today also the president of Patient Expert Center Belgium. We should have also in a few minutes jo our, our joining MEP Olikas, who is uh, 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 a, pr a previous health minister uh, from Lithuania, and he has been elected to the European Parliament for the Social Democratic Party in 2019. I hope Mr. Olekas will be able to join, and I see him. Uh, thank you, Mr. Olekas, for joining just on time. Uh, you cannot see me, but I can see you extremely well. So I will give you the floor, maybe for your opening uh, speech on uh, the importance you know, of the life science and biotechnology sector and when it comes to investment. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Do you hear me? We can hear you very well, Amy okay, Thank you. I'm in adopted position here, not in my cabinet, <laughs> because we have the external meeting here in Malta. 
Uh, dear colleagues, thank you very much for this possibility to be together with you and, and uh, discuss about this very important issue. I think just today we have some meetings of orphaned uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and others uh, in, in different formats. The, the European uh, Commission has launched an ambitious uh, pharmaceutical strategy. And as you mentioned, Bernard, there are no different discussion about that and uh, possibility to in, uh, strengthening this this uh, the, uh, situation. It has to uh, approve uh, patients access to safe and uh, affordable medicines and support health uh, innovation in the in the EU. Uh, the strategy aims to address the, the life cycle of uh, medicines from research and development to authorization and patient accesses. I think this very particular issue is the access for, for the innovative medicine. It will look into how Europe can better turn scientific and technological advance into practice. How to reply to the needs of European citizens and how to implement lesson learned from COVID-19 pandemic to better prepare for the future uh, health uh, possible crisis. We need more innovation in the EU. Today, the EU is facing major health and economical challenges and social transformation that have, uh, have been accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. In this context, uh, the health and the well-being of European citizens requires innovation, long-term vision, and increased coordination among the European uh, member states. The, the COVID-19 crisis has shown the critical role of the biotechnology in the response to the pandemic. Only science-based uh, research coming from the a strong life scientist industry, together with a well-functioning health system, can bring a long-lasting solution. The EU has to get back its leadership on research, uh, development, and health innovation. Below the competition between the European Union, United States, and China is very, very big. Because of the economic consequence of the COVID crisis, healthcare will have to play a greater role in European uh, competence. Now, the discussion about the conference on, on the future of Europe is going on, and I think this is one of the very important uh, issues. We have to coordinate the management of pandemic risk, prioritize healthcare budget, and foster research and biotechnology. Invest in a strong EU life science sector should be our priority. We also need to increase collaboration, better use of digital technologies, and coordination of process among the member states. COVID-19 has really revealed uh, the importance of innovation in dealing with the health emergency. To meet patients, needs it's very important to strengthen the bioscience sector and to stimulate innovation at its uh, source. Investment in research and development for innovative medicines and treatments is essential. It allows us to make progress in prevention and treatment of disease. Increased collaboration of the EU, member states, and public and private stakeholders can create solution for value-based innovation. By creating collaboration between patients, scientists, regulators, academics, healthcare professionals, organization, payers, and industry, we can set research priorities to the needs of patient and health system. We need to accelerate the coordination of science and technologies to promote health predict and prevent diseases, diagnose them, and use innovative medicine products and therapies for treatment. There are significant differences in the availability of new medical products among the EU member states. Working on more coordinated process in the different member states would contribute to quicker approvals and avoid doubling the work. 
Then it comes to the health care budget. The trend is often to cut cost instead to taking a broad approach that promotes health. We must change our priority from volume to value. A high quality, sustainable, and affordable healthcare system is based on outcomes that are important to patients, cost effective care, prevention, and health promotion. It must also reward the industry based on the value of their products and services. The new pharmaceutical legislation can release the potential of the EU biotechnology sector and support a competitive and innovative European biopharmacy industry. Biotechnology and digital transformation is a major driving force in life science innovation. Big data and biotechnology capabilities are given us a new wave of innovation that can improve the quality of life around the world. Healthcare particularly is in experiencing a major change of thinking for traditional one-size-fits-all care to personalized medicine. It is tolerated to the genomic and lifestyle characteristic of individual patients. Bringing in data gives pharmaceutical companies in a deep understanding of disease and helps develop targeted medicine treatment that are more efficient and safer, such as a cellular therapy, gene therapies, and genomic editing. The readiness for digital transformation is different between the member states, so we must ensure and harmonize regulation approach and standardization of data. We also must consider the diversification of manufacturing and lower the risk of local dependency. We need to build strong, resilient international supply chain, uh, create demand for a cast for supplies of critical medicine and implement a quick response based on the true patient need. We have to identify and introduce measures to support production capability, capacity in the EU, strengthen the supply chain and meet EU quality and environmental standards. The EU can lead in the manufacturing of innovative therapies by ensuring an effective regulation. An EU strategy for security of supply should focus on keeping production still present in Europe. A manufacturing friendly EU environment, including trade policies and sustainable market conditions, can give us a continuity supply of quality medicine. The EU regulation framework should be modern and adaptive to latest technology. There is need for an ambitious industrial policy that makes EU an attractive investment destination for innovative companies. There is a great regional social and economical potential for advanced biotechnology. Regional manufacturing hubs can soften the economic inequalities within, within and between European countries. To support a strong industrial strategy, a continuous dialogue with, strategy, with industry is necessary. We must make sure that there is enough investment in the resi resilient health system, including digital infrastructure and well-founded EU for health program. We have to increase our ability to trace medicine throughout the entire ecosystem, creating a manufacturing friendly environment to ensure a sustainable supply chain for innovation is the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Amy Piolekas, for your opening statement. I think many of the topics you, you have addressed will be discussed a little bit further. And thank you for staying with us uh, for, for this uh, panel discussion and the presentation. Uh, I would now give the floor to Mr. Stefan Geisel, who has been working with uh, Europa Bio quite closely on one study that has been released uh, in June this year, which is how to attract, you know, life science investments to Europe. Stefan, uh, given your different hats, I leave it. I leave you the floor, and maybe you can set the scene for the discussion on the importance of investment in healthcare, biotechnology, and life science. I leave you the floor, Stefan. Thank you, Bernard, and, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, 
I will speak about a study, as Bernard said, that we've been conducting for a number of years. Uh, and the objective, maybe next slide. Uh, next slide. The objective uh, is to identify what really determines the attractiveness for life science investments in different uh, countries in Europe. So we had long discussions with the partners in the project, which is the Europa Bio, the Biomedical Alliance, which is the umbrella organization of all the medical societies, uh, Johnson & Johnson, and also with the active participation of EU Life, which is the European Association of uh, Life Science uh, and Academic uh, Environment and, and Institutes. So the objective was to see how European countries score on these uh, indicators. And so we selected the countries that you can see on the slide. I will not uh, list them all uh, to start with, and uh, we're gradually expanding as the years uh, move forward. Uh, within this score, we identified what where does Europe stand vis-a-vis -vis the United States and China. And then we also made dashboards so that every of the indicated countries can identify where they score on the different indicators. The next slide gives some more clarity on the indicators. So we put them in four big buckets. Uh, the first one is a social and economical context with political stability, national competitiveness, innovative environment and gender equality. The second one is the industrial context with topics like labor productivity, availability of quality, qualified staff and, and payroll taxes. The third looks at the actual life science environment, is the number of publications, staffing, number of trials, investments, and uh, very important life science degrees. And then we also look at the healthcare environment, uh, quality of care, size of the budgets, uh, spending on pharmaceuticals and medtech, and then of course the availability of medicines and the time to availability and the digital health index. For all these together, we looked what is the best possible uh, score that you could have within Europe, and you can see the abbreviations of the countries on the right uh, with Germany and, and Switzerland scoring relatively high, and then you can see the median in the middle. For every country, we made a country portrait, so the country can see how they score on vis-a-vis -vis the median or the, be the, the best possible result, and actually determines its own strategy, see where the strengths are and the weaknesses are, so that uh, progress can be made, debate can be started. The whole study is done uh, with publicly available statistics. So it comes from WHO, OECD, uh, Eurostat, and other uh, public information sources. Um, and I think this will give the opportunity to the countries to design their own strategy in comparison with uh, the competition from other countries and regions. Next slide, please. We also compared Europe uh, with the United States, and I think this is also a very good debate starter for us because I think there's very often a lot of complacency in Europe on where we score and what we do in terms of uh, biotech innovation. Uh, if you just look at public health research, uh, we spend 6.9 billion on public health uh, research in Europe compared to 28.4 billion in the United States. So that is, uh, again, from reliable uh, public information sources. We see that the patent registration growth rate is three times higher in, in the United States than in Europe, and even nine times higher in China than in, in Europe. Life science venture capital is $11 billion in Europe, according to some estimates, compared to 30 billion in the United States. And the life science staff, which is actual people working in the life science industry, is, as you can see, uh, 500,000 in Europe and uh, 2.3 million in the United States. So these are environments that are really factors that are really critical. If you're an investor, you want to go where the money is, you want to go where the people are, with the, the qualified um, degrees. And if you look at another study that was done uh, last year, the total number of investments by US and European life science actors across sectors, so you can see biotech in, in blue, digital and artificial intelligence, medical devices and diagnostics. It is obvious that uh, Europe is lagging behind the United States and that it requires a significant effort uh, to become the most innovative region in the world as the European Commission had once uh, positioned it. Next slide, please. So 
we come with a number of recommendations, and these are very high level uh, overview of those. It is, as um, Mr. Oleg has said, absolutely critical to have a long term vision on where Europe wants to stand. Uh, Europe is very fragmented at the moment. So, despite the, the, the internal market and the internal co collaboration, uh, Europe is still fairly fragmented. So, we need a concerted and collaborative and sustained policy effort to make sure that uh, we can make a distinction uh, at a uh, global level. All aspects of the ecosystem are connected and should reinforce it, each other. So, it's really a mutual effort from political stability, industrial policy, life science education, the availability of venture capital, and also a welcoming regulatory environment for innovative uh, technologies. Uh, and then last but not least is that life science investments create value. I think this is one of the most underestimated aspects. People always talk about the cost of new treatments and the cost of new innovation, but we shouldn't forget that um, Manufacturing environment, creating um, exports that create value to society uh, around the world, but also to the people who produce them and who export them, but also value in terms of health access. Uh, it is obvious that the people who are active in, in, in research also are the first ones to adopt new technologies and innovation. So the more innovation we create our our continent, the faster access will be generated to the people in, uh, in, in the citizens of Europe. So I think I want to end here, use it as a debate starter, and we can uh, discuss these topics further in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Stefan, for setting up uh, the scene for this uh, session today. As you said, you know, investment in Europe is important for the healthcare sector. And I think uh, I will. I would encourage all people to to address uh, to go to this uh, study that has been published uh, in June this year. Uh, you're going to find, you know, the overview picture. You're going to find the comparison with other areas in the world, and you will have also a view by country for the selected countries in this report. So, without further ado, I'm going to move to Ingrid. Ingrid. Uh, you know, you're, you you have a lot of experience uh, in Belgium, but also in healthcare system, and you see how the environment has been changing. So we would really like to see from you, you know, how the pharma uh, could the pharmaceutical strategy in the EU serve innovation because it's a topic you're working on very closely over years, and having your views on that one would be very important. So the floor is yours, Ingrid. innovation in health and uh, I want to talk about what are the specific requirements in fact and what has to be done to make Europe a performing ecosystem and more specifically I would like to zoom in on uh, which kind of uh, actions we need to put in place to have a more integrated value chain of um, developing and um, um, producing medicines that really get uh, to patients and reach uh, patients. Next page. However, today there are multiple tensions that are um, uh, characterizing, in fact, our uh, current ecosystem. And we have the public health insurance uh, aspect and more uh, specifically the pressure on healthcare budgets. And we have, of course, also pharma companies uh, investing heavily uh, into um, in the development of new treatments and uh, innovative medicines. And all these um, tensions, of course, um, um, that we observe, like uh, effective medicines uh, that are available at affordable cost, but also unmet medical needs that have to be answered. Uh, we also have, of course, um, to have uh, availability of affordable medicines across Europe. So all these aspects um, influence our today's um, ecosystem, and obviously, and we want to all produce uh, more health, uh, have an, a, a healthier European population. Next slide. Now, we also see that we are the eve of a uh, big transformation in the sector. And we see that the biotechs are the motors uh, more and more of innovation. 
and that uh, big uh, pharma companies are more and more evolving from a very much product focused business model to more and more a service focused business model based on data insights, based on outcomes to be demonstrated uh, and generated, and also value maximization. And perhaps pharma is not the best place to, uh, to uh, uh, provide these kind of services, because we see on the other side also the so-called thing uh, companies, which is uh, face, uh, companies like uh, Facebook, uh, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and also uh, Alphabet, Google. Well, we see that these type of players are coming into the healthcare market. Uh, they are uh, fastly generating medical and well-being insights and also deploying ecosystem business models that control everything in our lives, including also health and disease. We see on the other side that um, uh, just one going back to the previous slide, please. There's one aspect that I would like to emphasize as well is that we see that the uh, pricing and reimbursement authorities are becoming also more buyers uh, instead of just purely payers. Uh, doing also more critical evaluation of the health benefits of new treatments that are coming to market and also facing uncertainties on the real life effectiveness of novel treatments. And of course, at the budget sustainability, which is, I think, um, useless to talk about because everybody knows this, and also the patient access uh, aspects, which becomes more and more challenging. So, in fact, all these kind of shifting roles requires also that we look into a different way how to set up ecosystems, build performing ecosystems for the future. Next slide. Um, the European pharmaceutical strategy, I think, is a very interesting opportunity for the whole sector to, um, to look at it and, and uh, take this up, in fact, to um, redefine uh, the strategy for each of the different countries in Europe. Uh, looking and taking care about um, the new roles that each of the stakeholders have and uh, putting the right policies in place, the right incentives and stimuli in place to be able to uh, build uh, more performing ecosystems. Next slide. Now, what is required and, and uh, what has to be done and uh, how to build, in fact, a uh, better and more performing ecosystem in Europe? Well, I think there are four major actions that have to be taken. The first one is that we have to start from clearly defining what the societal focus and purpose is. Uh, societal priorities uh, like unmet medical needs, um, certain health objectives have to be clearly defined as a starting point to further focus all efforts and investments towards these uh, priorities. Also, we have to ensure that innovation matches patient and also national health system needs. And then uh, also have to tailor incentives towards these kinds of unmet needs or these kinds of societal uh, priorities. And of course, if societal priorities have been defined, also taking the right measures to ensure affordability. And this is something that is important for all actors. Uh, governments and, um, and uh, paying authorities or payers have also to make sure that they take the right steps to make budgets available um, uh, on a multi-year basis so that it's also clear what the time horizon is for um, reimbursement of um, uh, new types of treatments that could address these societal priorities. A second action area should be to uh, also innovate the innovation process. Um, that means uh, look to other ways to uh, develop medicines and bring them to market. There is a central role for data, data use and data reuse, and more specifically, real world data to be uh, used for uh, as, as a starting point for new innovations and developing new treatments, but also for uh, the clinical uh, uh, development stage and uh, designing better clinical trials. Uh, and also in terms of better disease management that leads to better outcomes. We also need to look into new ways to fund uh, uh, small and medium enterprises in academia, uh, to also have the right incentives in place that more collaboration could take place. And also we have to look into 
more innovative ways to produce medicines uh, closer to point of care innovative uh, production methods and uh, i'm more um, zooming in uh, especially on um, personalized uh, medicines which requires different type of um, manufacturing processes and approaches uh, but also supply uh, chain uh, processes and the third action point, like said uh, by previous speakers, Europe is highly fragmented and we have really to focus on promoting collaboration on all fronts, which means cross-country collaborations uh, in breaking uh, and also breaking the authority silos, but really promoting collaborative R&D models. Complexities of the diseases, complexities in terms of understanding what um, uh, deliver how to deliver health is increasing and that requires in fact uh, to bring together the best minds the best expertise that is available but also very important to bring all the stakeholders together from the start that means uh, bringing the uh, researchers together with companies and investors and also the regulators and payers together right from the start of the development process and not bringing payers at the end of the process because at that moment input on the societal willingness to pay will be too late to focus research and development um, initiatives. The fourth action is then to really build integrated value chains. That means connecting the different uh, actors along the value chain, uh, bringing different expertise early on together, and also, like said, uh, bringing investors uh, and payers uh, together right from the start to assure that the right focus uh, on uh, the development of innovative treatments for the societal priorities is being made. Next slide. Now, to do this, we have to start with the societal needs uh, as a starting point, as a clear focus, in fact, for the whole value chain. And then from there, further build and streamline the different stakeholders and actors around that. Society uh, has to, uh, societal priorities have also to be further translated into, uh, of course, the societal willingness to pay. In which areas is society willing to invest um, and make sure also that uh, healthcare budgets for reimbursement are freed up and uh, made available, in fact, to fund and reimburse uh, such kind of um, new treatments that address these societal priorities. Authorities have to take the right steps to make sure that uh, also data access and reuse to demonstrate outcomes is available. We also have to think about robust IP models that support collaboration across the different uh, stakeholder, uh, stakeholders and uh, across different companies. And of course, industry has also to think about further to innovate the innovation process to further speed up the development, uh, certainly also collaborate on all fronts and uh, make sure that uh, partnerships are set up along the whole value chain. Next slide. Now, how can this be put in practice? Well, let's take the example of uh, breakthrough therapies like advanced therapeutic medical products. And I'm speaking here about cell and gene uh, uh, therapies, which are um, considered as uh, one of the, the big breakthroughs in science, which allows really, or has the promise to uh, really cure patients. Well, we have to make sure that we're not missing this boat in terms of being able to afford these treatments and make sure that the, they are uh, reaching patients. Well, there are multiple challenges uh, in the product life cycle of ATMPs, and uh, they are putting more pressure and tension on the way how we develop products and bring them to market. The product is the manufacturing process and vice versa, which requires already collaboration early on uh, between product developers and product manufacturers at the same time. But we also have to think about the regulatory framework, um, which has to be adapted for these type of treatments. Um, and we also have to make sure that the reimbursement system is also adapted for these most often one-time uh, administration uh, products uh, that have a lifelong uh, curing potential. Uh, so, reimbursement models as we have today is not anymore applicable for this type of therapies. And we have also to innovate on that side. Now, what is required, and that's what you see on the right side of this slide here, is that for, um, asset owners, as we call it, so uh, researchers that have um, invented 
a new uh, a new treatment that in fact uh, early on uh, the funding partners like uh, vcs investors uh, seed funds have to be brought together with also authorities and payers and also pharma companies that are perhaps later on the players that will commercialize uh, the product. All these actors have to be brought together right from the start and together have to build the value chain to assure that these valuable products get to patients at the end and that the right funding uh, can be brought together, but also the right focus is made based on the uh, payer uh, priorities, um, which is in, in, on its turn um, based on the societal uh, priorities. Next page. With that, I would like to conclude, in fact, that um, we need to enforce three virtuous circles that could allow us to build a strong ecosystem in Europe. And of course, it starts with medical progress and also innovation uh, that advances, in fact, the state of the art, uh, where new valuable treatments can be developed that could address uh, unmet needs and uh, societal priorities. And where we have to strengthen the biotech and pharmaceutical environment to further take these ideas, these new insights into products that could be made affordable for the market and can be offered, in fact, to patients. And then, of course, also where uh, the uh, payers have to make sure that uh, budgets are uh, allocated and foreseen on a multi-year basis that could accommodate the whole pipeline of these new treatments coming to market and make uh, sure that these, these uh, treatments can be reimbursed and can be made affordable for patients across Europe. And so with that, I would like to thank um, the audience and uh, thank you for your interest uh, in this presentation. Over to you, Bernard. <laughs> thank you, Ingrid. I think you, you brought a lot of food for thought here, and I'm sure we're going to have discussion on some of the items you're bringing to the discussion. Uh, thank you for that, Ingrid. Uh, without further ado, I would like to move to the next speaker, who is Mr. Oscar Slotboom. You know, we wanted uh, with Invest Europe to have also the investor perspective to the topic, because you know that uh, healthcare biotechnology is a very risky business and people have a tendency just to see, you know, the results of uh, the innovation that is brought. But before innovation, there are investors who are taking risk and who are putting money on the table. And it's important that we have also their view on what is important to attract investment. And in the remit of the pharmaceutical strategy, you know, what could be done better here in order for Europe to be more competitive. So, Oscar, I leave you the floor and thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you, Ben Aram. Um, happy, to, uh, happy to give our, our perspective here. Um, so, if we can go to the next slide, I'd like to immediately start with some good news. And this is uh, from a, a McKinsey report. I think uh, it was May 2019, but I'm, I'm pretty sure this is still accurate, where uh, actually uh, it's, it is published that the, the science production in Europe, if we compare this to the US, um, is at par or even uh, uh, even slightly more. Um, and this is actually also looking at the quality. So interestingly, when we see at the at the very foundation of innovation, so this is let's say academic uh, academic research in the field of life sciences and biotech, um, we actually see that Europe is not not really behind. And uh, at the same time, also when you look at and this is at the bottom of the of the slide, um, you see that uh, the European contributions to to FDA drug approvals. I mean, this is basically all drug approvals as most of these drugs are, of course, also approved in other uh, continents, 13% um, uh, Europe, but 32%, so a significantly higher percentage is what we call emerging modalities. And it was already mentioned before, cell and gene therapy are, are, are for instance, an important part of that. And what it actually tells us is that um, on, at the side of innovation, uh, at the basis, uh, Europe is actually certainly not behind the US, uh, I would say at par with the US. And maybe anecdotally also, when we look, of course, at the uh, Corona vaccines, um, uh, all of the ones approved in, in Europe and the US, except for one, are, originate actually from European science. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, all but one are actually marketed by US companies. So I think it, it, it sort of shows, I think, where the problem lies. Um, and this is, and I'll come back to that if we go to the next slide. 
Um, and the problem lies, I think, and there's a lot of um, factors playing into that, that the actual environment to translate that science into products and bring these to patients is very different. And a big part of that is actually the funding. It was already mentioned before by Stefan. Here it is quoted as a 4.6 times larger funding envelope in the US versus Europe. You know, depending on, on what you look at exactly, this is certainly, let's say, three to five times more in the US uh, versus Europe. And interestingly, when you look at, uh, at the yellow box at the bottom of the slide as another uh, data point here, um, when we look at European biotechs going on for follow on offerings. So these are relatively <laughs> successful biotech companies that raise larger rounds to bring products to, for instance, later stage clinical trials, 98% find the funding in the US. So actually we see there's a, there's a big discrepancy um, between the US and Europe in terms of actual output. Um, and I think there is something going certainly wrong, but, but the good news I think to remember is we have a basis to work from in Europe, which is uh, an academic science scene, which, which in our view is, is certainly not, um, not behind the US. So this is a problem I think we can solve. It will take some time, but it's certainly much easier to solve than for instance, the position that China has where uh, we do see, of course, a lot of development, but certainly in terms of the academic science production is certainly at a very different level. So coming to what would be the factors that could help us take more of that very interesting uh, science that is really at the forefront globally, particularly in some of these new and interesting areas, and to actually bring that to, uh, to commercial products. So if we go to the next slide, there's five factors, if I remember well, six factors even, that, um, that I would say from taking a real you know, investor perspective, I would say here, um, that could make a real difference. And uh, first, first of that, I think the first three really relate to, to the financial inflow of capital. So first of all, we see quite a lot of companies in Europe, uh, biotech companies in Europe listing immediately on the NASDAQ. And the reason for that is that there is no uh, actual liquid um, uh, European exchange for these kind of companies. It's probably something that is broader than biotech. I would say this is probably also the case for tech um, uh, companies. And the whole environment around that, um, that uh, in this case at, at the NASDAQ and US investors um, would constitute uh, you know, a group of investors that's really knowledgeable and that can really judge what is the value of these companies and which ones to invest in and which not. And that's a critical element of, I, I think, a successful biotech scene. And that is something that can only be you know, created here or you know, said differently to stop, let's say, the outflow, um, I think, of companies really listing on, on, the, on the NASDAQ um, that would be a, a very important part of, of a future ecosystem in Europe. And this is something that's been tried before with the Neue Market, for instance, in Germany, but something where really across European countries and at the uh, European level, I think we should, uh, we should be able to, to designate one initiative to set this up. Secondly, mobilize European retail investments. I think there's quite a lot of uh, money, of course, uh, particularly also at this time, that's invested from the retail sector. Uh, France, for instance, has an interesting uh, an interesting approach with the FCPI funds, where there are certain tax uh, advantages of investing um, investing retail so for retailers investing their money into certain sectors uh, within their own country. But this can also be done at the European level. And thirdly, uh, the same essentially for pension funds. So anecdotally, I think as a as we are now 140 million euro uh, seed fund in biotech um, uh, raising capital going to pension funds in Europe, we, we often hear the answer um, when we ask whether they will be interested to invest. We're very interested to invest, but our minimum, uh, our minimum investment size is 100 million. And we can only do that in US hedge funds. So I think just from, anecdotally, I think this is, this is my, uh, you know, my everyday life when we raise funds. Um, this, these are problems that can be solved, uh, and I think pension funds uh, should have certainly a bigger role um, uh, in, in investing in the European uh, innovation sector. I think there's also a willingness, but there are some practical things to work through which can be done through some policies, I would say.
Uh, fourthly, um, and now we come more to the infrastructure side, and we should probably look more towards China, how this is done. Um, one of the one of the big uh, inhibitions at the moment, um, certainly over the last years, but generally is to have uh, lab space, space for companies to uh, to start and also to be part of an ecosystem. So there are two parts that are important. One is to have to have space, to have capacity. And secondly, to have this as part of a bigger ecosystem. So designating these areas and actually investing from a government point of view in this infrastructure, like it is done in China at a very large scale um, and offering that at you know reasonable and market rates is an important um, is an important factor. And we now actually see some of our portfolio companies struggling to find, you know, place to uh, to expand and to work. And I think having that as a as a break on the development of courses is, is absolutely unacceptable. Fifth is the removing some of the administrative and regulatory red tape. So it was mentioned um, uh, the uh, advanced therapies that uh, Ingrid mentioned. What we actually see is that the clinical trial regulations for some of these uh, advanced therapies are very different from country to country, uh, are actually um, unnecessarily cumbersome. I mean, this really puts a break on, on European innovation. Um, IP ownership of academics in a number of countries makes it, in some cases, very hard to start companies uh, based, on, uh, based on actually IP that was generated and funded by institutions. Um, and there's also certain, you know, a lot of differences between countries for uh, starting companies. So starting a company in Germany versus the Netherlands, I think there's a huge difference. And I think some of these things could be done a lot better. Um, and lastly, I think it was also already mentioned that as a European sector, I think we would also benefit from having more of the clinical trial capabilities and pharmaceutical production in Europe, whereas now we actually see uh, this also, uh, yeah, particularly on the production side, um, uh, not actually within our, our borders. In the context of the pandemic, of course, this was discussed extensively, but I think as part of an ecosystem, this should also be more part of Europe, as well as probably for, for more strategic reasons. Now, all of this, I think, can be done. And again, one of the things where we should probably look to, to China to see how you do this is actually set these directions and stick to that for, for a somewhat longer period of time. Now, our political system, of course, not the same. So Mr. Olikas may be commenting on that, whether this is feasible, but, but certainly we see good initiatives for one or two or three years being being fueled with some funding and some attention, but then dying down again. And I think this is something that that certainly we should do better. And this is only this is a sector where it takes 10 years to get something to the market. It's not going to to really make a, a difference if we are going to to make a one or two year uh, exercise of it. So these are some of the things that uh, come to mind on the investor side. On the last slide, I'll be brief on that. I think it is somewhat repetitive what was said before. Um, investing in these innovative therapies will really have a positive impact on patients, but also on national healthcare budgets. I think without exception, you can see these approvals accommodate uh, are, are uh, based on health economic assessments that actually show um, um, uh, that actually show that the overall impact on healthcare budgets is is positive, if not significantly positive, although the treatment itself may be expensive. And as an example, some of these gene therapies, which may cost, you know, a hundred thousand up to a million per patient may actually um, uh, mean that a patient is cured and would not need a lifelong treatment, which in aggregate would be much more expensive. Um, in addition, of course, the number two is uh, if we uh, if we do all of this, of course, it will also generate jobs, royalty, income taxes, etc. So that was, I think, uh, goes without saying. Thank you for your attention. Looking forward to the uh, to the Q and A later. Thank you, Oscar, for bringing the investors' view, and I think you have a few points that we will certainly discuss a little bit later. But thank thank you for for covering so much uh, space in such a short time. Uh, I would like to introduce now our last uh, speaker on the presentation side, who is Mrs. Isabel Schubert. She's working on IP strategy at Novartis, and I think she can bring also this view on how IP is important in view of the ongoing review of the uh, legislation. 
So Isabel, uh, I give you the floor now and give us a little bit overview of the importance of IP in our healthcare sector as such. Thank you very much, Bernard. Yes, so um, why is IP so important for biopharmaceutical innovation? And how could the ongoing uh, review impact the IP environment in Europe? So um, really, the IP is the foundation of the biopharmaceutical um, business model. And when I say IP, I mean, you know, patents, the supplementary protection certificates that we have in Europe that then um, can extend patents by up to five years, the regulatory data protection, which is abbreviated as RDP here, or the open market exclusivity, or the pediatric extension. All these um, together build the um, uh, system of pharmaceutical incentives, which are really vital to um, for, for uh, companies um, to take um, investments, these long-term and risky investments into R&D. And uh, finally, that leads them to an ecosystem where innovative new drugs, but also um, generic drugs and biosimilars available, which allow um, patients and all of us to have a better quality of life. Um, IP is also crucial for, for collaboration for, for, um, because it sets a foundation in which the agreements can be um, built. So here on this slide, you just see a little bit how, how um, the IP system um, is, is uh, there in relation to the innovation cycle in the pharmaceutical sector. You see, it starts with um, research where you know up to a hundred, ten thousand compounds um, are are um, found for a particular target. Then uh, this is reduced uh, going into the um, development phase, which can take up to twelve years until a drug is um, actually approved. Following approval, we have the um, the uh, pricing and reimbursement negotiations, and only then, once that is um, achieved, uh, a vaccine can, can reach a patient. And you see this very big attrition rate from you know, 10,000 um, compounds in research to hopefully one um, medicine which reaches patients in the best case, because of course, a lot of them you know, uh, fail along, along the, uh, the way. And um, subsequently, you have um, the generics, when the, when the IP expires, you have the generics which enter the markets and, and generics and, and biosimilars play a very important uh, part for the innovation cycle because they free up the funds in the system for further innovation. And uh, so underneath this uh, bar of showing the innovation cycle in the pharma sector, you see the, the um, different types of uh, IP incentives that we have um, in Europe. So as we have around the globe, we have patents which um, last 20 years. And um, it's important to note that the patents are filed um, really once a, a compound has been selected for, for um, development, which is typically at year minus 12. Then it takes around 12 years on average to develop a drug. and um, so essentially what you see that the time that is left of a patent once a drug is approved and not even yet you know, reaching the patient because it still has to go through the pricing reimbursement steps. From that time on, when a drug is approved, it has on average eight years of patent term left. That's by this uh, IP right of the supplementary protection certificate, which extends patent by up to five years is so vital. Um, underneath that, you see the bar of the uh, regulatory data protection. That one, that IP right starts um, with marketing approval and in Europe lasts for eight years um, and plus two years, so in total 10 years, which can be extended um, by one year for a significant new indication. The regulatory data protection provides the protection for the data package which is um, produced during the development uh, of a drug and, and, and uh, submitted to the um, health authority for getting approval of a drug. 
And then underneath the um, regulatory data protection, you see the orphan exclusivity, which in Europe is 10 years and can be extended by up to year up to two years um, by two years for for pediatric research pertaining to this orphan uh, medicine. Um, in addition, the SBC or not in can be extended by six months as well for, for um, pediatric research and that's and we could refer to that as the pediatric reward. So this is the system of IP that um, um, support that we have in Europe and it's important to note that when a investment decision is taken at year minus 12 we look at the IP um, potential that this project has you know some of them have good and long patent protection some of them don't um, and and that's when the other um ip um, I, um rights like regulatory data protection or orphan exclusivity become very important for for investment decisions into a molecule because if there is only very limited patent um, protection available then this can still be um, a, a reason why an investment decision is taken because they can provide you know, the 10 years of exclusivity that is really needed for, for such an investment decision. However, if a molecule does not have any of these, there is not, not going to be any investment. So it's important to note that a single product may not have you know, all of these um, uh, exclusivities. In fact, often does not have all of these, but has the one or the other. And it's it's also important to have, you know, the flexibility um, of having the one or the other because because otherwise um, some some molecules may not be developed. And and it's the same way, you know, we look at when we evaluate an asset that comes from a small or medium sized enterprise or, or an academic. Um, whether, whether we are going to um, um, enter into a, an acquisition or, or, um, or a licensing agreement for this asset, we at this stage as well evaluate, you know, is there sufficient exclusivity for this project? Um, and uh, in order to be able to take this um, long-term and risky investment decision into this, um, into this uh, molecule. And if that's not the case, then of course, again, you know, the decision cannot be taken. Of course, IP is not the only decision factor. It's one amongst a number of decision factors, but it is an important one. And, uh, and so how does the ongoing review um, impact the decisions taken as at year minus 12? You know, it, it raises a concern about predictability so if we're looking at an asset that comes from a, from a, from a small biotech and it's a cell and gene asset, it may not have very strong patent protection. And, and we, we, we determine that the IP that we can rely upon for this project is often exclusivity. And now with the ongoing review, we don't know, oops, what should we tell the business? How long is the orphan exclusivity going to be? then that really leads to a lack of predictability and we will we will you know be conservative in the in that assessment and say okay you know it, it may not be the 10 years anymore it may be shorter and and that really then um, um, uh, leads leads to a, a more conservative assessment and which could uh, which could impact the investment decision so and and also going forward if let's say there are new conditionalities um, applied to the incentives which we as a company feel we cannot control like like for example launching most or all member states that then that raises raises again uh, you know a, a, a concern regarding predictability and, and may uh, impact investment decisions in Europe so how does the system of IP environments how does the, that compare today with um, other other jurisdictions, and and I must say, you know, today the IP environment in the EU looks really good. That's why I've sort of shown it here as as uh, green. We have um, we have enforceable patents 
same as in the US and in Japan. We have the supplementary protection certificate, which extends the patents, which really once a drug comes to the market, may only have 10 years left by up to five years, same as the US and Japan. We have a strong regulatory data protection system of 10 years, which can be extended by up to one year for, for both um, new, new chemical drugs and new biological drugs. In the US, this is five years for chemical drugs and 12 years for biological drugs. In the US, indications get three years additional exclusivity as well. In Japan, we have eight years of, of regulatory data protection for, for new molecular entities and four to six years for new indications or combinations. And the orphan exclusivity also exists in these three um, jurisdictions uh, for seven, ten, seven or ten years again. And the pediatric extension in Europe is extending the SEC by six months. In the US, it's extending all exclusivities that are listed in the Orange Book by six months, and in Japan, it's extending RDP by two years. And um, um, when you look at China, you can see that, and that's why you know, I mark this as something somewhere between you know yellow and green, because um, they have really made some significant cha changes to the law recently in terms of enforceability of patents, and they have also introduced SBCs and PTE. But as I'm not so sure yet how exactly this will, and it's very recent, only this year, how this will uh, work in practice. I sort of given that a sort of a shaded uh, appearance here on this slide, and then um, the. Um, China still has some significant gaps when it comes to regulatory data protection or an exclusivity of pediatric extension. When you look at the rest of the world, you know, clearly with some few exceptions, where, which also have a, a stronger uh, IP environment, there it's not nearly as strong as in the U US or, or Japan. So overall, you know, we have a good IP environment in, in Europe and we should be proud of it and, and not really um, risking it and, and making it less secure um, for, for investors to invest into research in, in Europe. And uh, so what specifically are the risks um, to the predictability of the IP system in Europe? You know, there, there is um, the, um, we, we, see, we see a risk that the incentives could get shortened or even some abolished or that the availability could get restricted or that they are tied, at least in part, to conditions that we cannot control, like launch in most all member states. And uh, this can, you know, as I tried to explain, already impact investment decisions today, this risk of, of what is going to happen to the environment in Europe. But also going forward, once the new law is in place and the conditionalities are introduced that, you know, a company cannot control, then it will lead to a lack of, um, predictability and this will certainly you know uh, impact investment decisions and ultimately patients and so I, I would say you know let's not give up what we have in Europe a strong and competitive IP system and any changes to the system should be such that they allow this long-term predictability and a sufficient level of exclusivity to allow these uh, long-term and risky investment decisions thank you Thank you very much, Isabel, uh, for bringing the IP <clears throat> topic uh, to the discussion. Clearly, you know, IP is a cornerstone for the life science industry, and it's important to stress its importance. Now that we have gone through the different presentation, and thank you, Mr. Olikas, to be with us, uh, would you have a, a few reactions to what you heard from the different speakers? Any specific uh, points that you take from, from what they have presented? Okay, Th thank you, Bernard. Indeed, first of all, I would like to thank all of you for very informative and uh, uh, presentation. And I, from my point of view, it looks that we all like-minded uh, team here <laughs> together and thinking about the, the future and the, seeing the, the same problems and the, the way how we can uh, uh, try to solve this 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 problems on the way because the I think this the 
strong and uh, effective, innovative uh, uh, bio uh, science here in, in Europe is, is very needed and uh, in this uh, quite uh, competitive uh, environment uh, regarding the US and China and maybe Japan, as Isabella mentioned. Uh, indeed, colleagues, I think that uh, we, we should find a way how we can uh, strengthen our effort, our, our, our facilities, and how we can uh, maybe allocate more resources for, for, for that through the European Union, have more uh, common uh, environment in the European Union, not uh, 27 different uh, environments in uh, each member state, but, but uh, more unified European uh situation and uh, also i think it's it's very important to to create the, the, the possibilities for, for our patient to to have this uh, accessibility for for this innovative method regarding the the patents i think it's uh, everything it's fine but but maybe just uh, this uh, situation where the global pandemic was uh, a specific issue when we start in the parliament to discuss how we can improve the, this uh, accessibility and to have different maybe uh, situation and approaches for, 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 for the patents, uh, thinking about the, 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 the possibilities to supply the, the not uh, rich countries, rich region, but the regions like uh, Africa and others, and, and this is, was one of the, the discussion. When the states, when the European Union allocate uh, huge resources for, for research, for development, and, and then to think about uh, how uh, can we support to, to reach the, 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 our uh, patient. And in general, but okay, thank you very much, and I was very happy to hear from you this, this uh, information, and I hope that we can use this for, for the future discussion in the European Parliament. Thank you, Mr. Olekas. I, I will, I will now I, give... Yes. May I react to that? Yes, so yeah, that I, I wanted to give you the floor, Stefan, because okay, you. you're wearing a very important hat in my view on that panel, which is the patient view, as you've been very active historically on the Digestive Cancer Europe Association and that you are now the president of Patient Expert Center in, in Belgium. Uh, you know, it would be good to have you view coming from the patient side and what you see in this discussion and what type of points you would like to make, you know, outside of the study you have just presented, but giving the patient perspective on, on the debate we're having here. Yeah. So I, I can speak on behalf of cancer patients, which I know best, is that we have seen, uh, first of all, amazing uh, results in the past 10 years of new cancer drugs coming to the market. Uh, I think only last year, 20 new drugs were approved uh, at European level, which is amazing. So I think for all different indications and especially quite a number of rare cancers. Um, this goes in parallel to the investments and the in growth of the market size. So I think the, the, the market aspect and the sales aspects of drugs also influences the investments made uh, by, by industry. And so for the first time we see, you know, especially digestive cancers with very high mortality, like esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, there's barely any public research in these areas. Um, very, very little. I think they are totally under-researched in, in, in stark contrast to other types of, of cancer. And what we see now is that because of the availability of very high performing drugs in immunotherapy and, and, and targeted therapies, that now these companies are expanding uh, in research in new indications. And I think this is for the first time in many years that we see actual research being done in esophageal, gastric and, and pancreatic cancer. And I think this, this is the result. It's very high risk research because the mortality and the chances of success are, are pretty limited. But I think that is also the result of uh, the research that is being, uh, the, the prices and, and uh, the value of these new drugs that are currently on the market. And so I think this is a, a type of dynamic in the, in, the, in the research environment that is often poorly understood 
uh, by legislators. Because I think from a patient perspective, they focus far too much on the availability and the affordability. I think the, these are the buzzwords that we hear all the time. But what you need first is the existence of new molecules and, and, and new indications. I think that is the critical thing. I think you can, uh, you can argue and, and discuss till the cows come home about uh, access and affordability, but you need the drugs in the first place. And I think this is the number one priority that Europe should focus on. What can we do to have more drugs uh, for unmet medical needs? And then the second question is, how to, can we make sure that they are accessible and affordable? But I think the first question is, how do we get more drugs for the diseases of today and, and tomorrow? Thank you, Stefan, for your view. Uh, maybe I'm going to move to uh, quite a political question, and I, I will uh, take you, Ingrid, to, to, to respond to that one, because you brought up the point. You know, this question of societal priorities and investment in health, rather than looking at it as only the cost side of the investment. Do you think, you know, Europe has this long-term vision that Mr. Olikas was mentioning before? Because when we see what's happening in the country, sometimes we see so many disparities that we have sometimes the impression this long-term vision on investment in life science does not really exist. But uh, I would like to have your views on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, one of the strengths of Europe is uh, indeed also having this uh, social tissue, let's say. And that means uh, uh, having also this more uh, societal uh, viewpoint is, is something where Europe has historically been always very strong. And I think we need to be more explicit in terms of planning resources. And I'm saying on purpose resources in a broad sense, it's not just money, but it is also allocating people allocating infrastructure. Um, so we have to be more explicit in terms of saying what are for Europe the biggest societal needs which have to be addressed. And we have then to build plans uh, to make or to, to make that happen. And that means then to focus all the efforts, all the resources that we need to get there. Uh, like what Stefan was say, saying, indeed, there are areas where we don't have good solutions and where there are still high unmet needs in development in a developed region as Europe. Yeah, this is something that we need to focus on uh, first. And there, there are a lot of good ideas, but what we often see is that ideas are sometimes stuck into academia on uh, ideas on new uh, treatment mechanisms. But often these researchers lack the network to bring those products to the next level of development. Um, uh, so, in fact, what we need is to be able to connect good ideas to a whole network of actors that are required uh, along the value chain to bring it finally to patients. And that means um, bring parties together that have the know-how, have the skills and, uh, and the experience in developing these kind of things and bringing them to market, but also uh, then also prioritizing and uh, allocating the required investments. And investments can be, again, uh, a combination of private investments and public investments. Uh, what we suffer from today is that all these things uh, uh, are fragmented. We, we are a highly innovative region, but the number of innovations that get to patients is where the real issue is. And that requires more connecting all the different uh, knowledge, experience, infrastructure, resources in a broad sense. Uh, that's what I think is needed. Thank you, Ingrid. Bernard, is it okay if I comment on that or? Yeah, of course, Oscar, if you want to jump in on that one. Yeah, exactly. So I think Ingrid said it right. I think it is it is about, you know, connecting, you know, some of that research in these areas to, you know, to all of those people and all those parties that are needed to bring it to a successful product. And that's one of the things that that we do as as investors, as particularly early stage investors. And I think uh, as also one of the questions in the chat was about, you know, the orphan incentives um, change in Europe. I, I don't actually think that that will change necessarily the attractiveness for investment in Europe, but what it does do, it actually changes the attractiveness to invest in some of the products that Stefan is actually referring to that are not there, you know, products that would serve patients that are currently not served. And traditionally, uh, or let's say over the last uh, decades, I think we have seen that public investment 
in that very early stage, sort of trying to, to then bring those forward have not been very effective. And the reason is that that doesn't actually have this whole ecosystem around it that, you know, that, that the, the biotech industry um, has, that the, the VCs have, that bringing all of the capital and the knowledge and the network together to bring this to a success. So I would argue that from a policy point of view, you know those products that, or those areas where there are, where there are patients that are underserved, and, and I think there are certainly a lot in oncology and also in other areas. Um, there there should be incentives to go there so that the market, i.e., you know, the particularly the the, the the funders, would actually find it more attractive to invest in that because that's the trade off that we need to make every day. Is it a large indication, with you know? A significant step forward for patients, but patients that have already treatments today versus maybe a smaller group of patients that where it can make a huge difference. But, you know, without, you know, that uh, I think also uh, that uh, Isabel mentioned, you know, certainty that there would be, you know, a certain protection for a longer period of time. It is, it, it is just not feasible to go there and without the market actually being interested to go there, these therapies will not come. Thank you, Oscar. Bernard, can, can I make yes, another you, comment? You're reacting, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, because I think what is also important is the end stage of the value chain. Uh, um, what Oscar was saying, yeah, indeed, we, we have to make sure uh, that um, uh, investors have, uh, invest in the things that uh, are really interested, uh, interesting for society. But if reimbursement is not happening at the last stage, if budgets, healthcare budgets are not available sufficiently available to afford, then the whole innovation and all the efforts that have been made is worthless. And that, that would be the end of the whole innovation engine. And so that was the plea that I tried to make is payers have to be very clear up front for multiple years which areas they want to focus on and prioritize. That will be key, in fact, to al align all the kind of resources that are required towards uh, these aspects, these uh, societal need aspects where payers are prepared to pay for it. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, you wanted to make a point, Isabel, certainly. Yeah, I just wanted to say, yes, exactly. You know, getting pricing and reimbursement is part of the incentive system, actually. You know, it's, it, it plays together. And and uh, there was also this question that you put there, um, Stefan, in the chat for, you know, how to incentivize uh, new new uh, indications. So, so in, uh, you have this plus one, uh, you know, um, addition to RDP for, for significant new indications that would expand it to 11 years. You have um, also patents that you can file on new indications or in Switzerland, for example, they have introduced a separate um, for 10 years regulatory data protection for, for new indications recently. But, but with all of that, you know, what is challenging is that if the, if the exclusivity for the compound in an other indication has expired, there is going to be cross prescription of you know even if the if there is still protection for the new indication there's going to be cross prescription and and that's you know so so then uh, so actually you know there is the, the incentive is almost meaningless so so what would would need to happen but that would need to happen as at, at a national level is that you have you know um, pr um prescription and reimbursement by indication so that this um, new indication is actually also then, you know, reimbursed and that because that's part of the incentive, the exclusivity alone is meaningless if, if the price isn't there as a part of the incentive. Yeah. And I think that was the meaning of my question, because I think this is what we see, especially in oncology. Uh, basically, a molecule is no longer just for one indication, you have multiple indications for one molecule. And I think that in, in the future will even uh, uh, expand further. So I think you should actually have protection by indication rather than by, uh, by molecule. Or, or rather a multi-indication um, reimbursement model. And that's something where we have to work towards mm -hmm. uh, because we will see more and more therapies that uh, will solve an, a systematic or systemic uh, approach in our body. So that means we will have um, uh, the same treatment that can work on multiple uh, pathways. 
um, and to cure multiple uh, diseases. Uh, so we, we need, in fact, also to think about uh, a broader multi-indication reimbursement system uh, to, to also provide more uh, clarity and uh, predictability uh, on the future for the innovators. May I add one point to what Ingrid said earlier? Because I think it's, it's very important for from a patient perspective that we actually help patients in the best possible way by looking at the entire treatment pathway and see what can be done to make sure that the best value is generated in every step of the treatment, uh, all types of intervention. In, in oncology, uh, drugs are only 15% of the oncology budget, right? In Europe, 15%. And so it's very important to see how much money is being wasted. So at the moment, there's in Europe more money being wasted on wrong treatments, bad treatments, late diagnosis, late, uh, uh, et cetera, that is higher than the medicines budget. Yeah. So people who say that the healthcare system is not sustainable at the moment don't know the healthcare system. So I think it's very important for Europe to have very clear objectives from the very beginning very clear data collection in every step of the way to know what we are talking about. Uh, and I think in Europe at the moment, we lack the data. We don't know how much money is being invested in life science research, not by type of disease. Uh, we don't know how many patients are diagnosed with one type or disease uh, or another. So there's a lack of, of, of data that would help us to make rational decisions and intelligent choices. And I think that is really one thing that Europe could do instead of being blinded always by the same narratives on, 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 on pharmaceuticals and, and access and pricing. Look at the entire system. Where do we need data to make the most rational and the most intelligent decisions? And I think that will identify where the gaps are. Also in research, uh, the, the gaps in, in, in public research, basic research, and then especially the translation from you know, scientific insights into um, more commercially viable uh, environments. I think that transition is what is, as, as Oscar said, absolutely lacking in Europe. And I think with more data, with more statistics, all that could be much clearer. And I think that's a role that Europe could play, the European Commission could play, because they could ask the member state to be more specific about the money they invest in the different areas of research. I think uh, Mr. Olekas wants maybe to react because I think it's an important one, you know, creating room for innovation as an industry. We know that, you know, resources are not endless, but we need also to look at the pockets where we can shift, you know, and create this room for innovation. And uh, yes, uh, there is this focus on affordability and availability, which we all uh, agree to. But we need also to create this room and there are areas where money has been spent historically, where the value of those money spent might be not at the level that should be, and where we could certainly reshift some of those resources towards innovation and creating an ecosystem that is much more strong than the one we know today. That's certainly the challenge for us, but Mr. Olekas, you have certainly some views on those. Yeah, yeah, just can uh, support the position of Stefan Krehi, but um, uh, mentioning because this is, I think, a reality for, for our um, uh, citizens, for our patients, and we should indeed uh, put uh, in the center of all our discussion and, and uh, uh, go also the, the, this uh, patient, patient uh, situation because this inequalities uh, between the countries, uh, between the member states and inside some countries, I think it's very, very uh, huge one. And we should uh, try to engage more our efforts to, to solve this, these problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see time flying. It's already 1.30. So there were some other questions that we will address certainly later on with, with the speakers. Uh, I would like just to give the floor to all the speakers, thank them for their contribution and the, the thought process that they contributed to. Uh, maybe, you know, just one key element that you want, would like the audience to take away before we close the meeting. Uh, I will start uh, with you, Isabel, if you have, you know, one key element that you would like the audience to take away from the discussion we had today. Yeah, we have a strong and effective IP system in Europe. Let's not give it away. As a competitive benefit. 
Ingrid, you wanna? Yeah, I, I want to further build on that and say we have um, strong ingredients for a future health ecosystem uh, in Europe, but we have to do better in connecting all these ingredients uh, better to uh, lead to better results and outcomes for patients. Oscar? Thank you. Yeah, just remember that our, our science production in Europe is second to none. So we just need to direct the money in the right direction here. And I think we have the tools to do it. Thank you, Oscar. Stefan? I think we need more Europe. I think less fragmentation and more Europe, I think, uh, and, and in a more systematic way, looking at uh, how diseases can be solved. And Mr. Olekas, you have certainly a, a closing thought that you want to share with the audience. We need stronger health uh, Europe. I think this union, this is the main goal how to uh, solve this uh, many problems for the research, for the science, for the, our patients. Thank you very much, Mr. Olikas. And on behalf of Europa Bio, I would like really to thank all for your contribution. Clearly, you know, we, we wanted to have those discussions on incentive and you can see uh, the, the result of the slide though. Uh, and what type of ideas have been uh, mentioned uh, during our, our discussion. Obviously, the discussion about, about incentives comes in the forefront. What I would like to say from a Europe Bio perspective is that you can count on us, you know, to be part of that discussion. Uh, we have all seen that uh, from Oscar that the science, you know, in Europe is good. What we need to do, and we have all identified the areas where we see weaknesses in the ecosystem. And you can count on Europa Bio to work on those weaknesses for the ecosystem in order to have a stronger Europe. We have seen the funding uh, disparities that can exist, but also the fragmentation that uh, Stefan alluded to. I believe, you know, we can, as uh, Europa Bio, contribute to that discussion. And in light of the upcoming discussion on the pharmaceutical legislation revision, uh, you can be sure that with our members and all the stakeholders we are working with, uh, we will try to contribute uh, to uh, to this consultation and make sure that you know we have the right incentives in place in Europe in the future, and that we have a thriving sector that is competitive with the rest of the world. With this, I close the meeting and thank you again for your attention. I hope that next time my camera will work and that I will be able to have a eye contact with the speakers. But thank you again for for the discussion. It's just the start. We will have some other events around that and we will be able to deep dive in some of the topics that have been addressed here. But thank you again for your attention and all this material will be shared with, with all of you on our internet site. And do not hesitate to come back to us if you have any questions regarding this session. I wish you all a good day and do not forget to look at the other events of the Biotech Week. There are plenty that are planned all over Europe. Uh, there is plenty of, uh, of sessions going on digitally, so take advantage of it if you have any interest. Thank you to all of you and have a good day. Thank you. Bye.